Welcome. I'm Susan Boyer, Senior Pastor of the Laverne Church of the Brethren, and I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us for worship. I can't tell you what an amazing process it is for me each week to participate in bringing worship to you in this format. There is a whole team of people that pull this service together every week. I am astounded what a group of people working together for the whole can produce while practicing physical distancing. It reminds me that the Spirit of God is amongst us. I want to make sure you know that you are welcome here. You are welcome if you are near or far. Identify as male, identify as female, or are gender fluid. You're welcome here. You're welcome here if you call this your church home, or for one reason or another, you've joined us during this time of pandemic. You are welcome here if you are an introvert or an extrovert, if you are the kind of person who likes to sit up front at church or sit on the back row of the balcony, if you like to sing or can't hold a tune, if you love to hike or you prefer to get your steps walking back and forth from the kitchen, you are welcome here. Communication has become more challenging for us during this time of safer at home. We no longer have a weekly bulletin that you get filled with pages of information about upcoming events. We encourage you to check out the church website often at lavernecob.org. We work to keep that current and things are moving fast. If you call the Laverne Church of the Brethren your church home, you should have received our monthly email on Friday filled with information about events in May. If you did not and would like to, to get it, please subscribe by clicking the button on your homepage at lavernecob.org. We try to keep you informed of upcoming events and opportunities, but it is more difficult when we do not see each other every week. The website lists all the virtual Connect small groups for May. You can join the Bible study with Pastor Tom or listen to him read his book. I probably shouldn't have told you that. You can do peaceful yoga with Paige. You can join me in finding the Christ figure in movies. You can learn about the early church, have Monday morning devotions, join the book study, or find out the opportunities for children, parents, families, and youth. If you didn't catch my encouragement before, I really hope that you will regularly check the church's website. We also encourage you to look at our Facebook group, Laverne COB Community. Help us keep you informed. Every week I remind you of the ways you can contribute financially to the church during this time of physical distancing. I think you know that you can do it by clicking on the PayPal button on the website or sending a check to the church or having your bank do it. This Sunday I just I want to thank you for what you have contributed so far. I know these are unsettling times, and yet many of you have been able to continue to send money to fund the ministries of this church. I am constantly overwhelmed with the goodness and generosity of all of you. Your leadership is working on your behalf to figure out how we can continue to provide worship, connection, and service. Please know, I thank God for you every day. So as we continue to worship together, let me remind you that you are called to be the salt of the earth. You're called to be flavorful, to be a preservative, to be used for healing, to be a binding agent. You are called to be texture to the world, to nourish it, 
You are the salt of the earth, O people, salt for the kingdom of God. Let us join together in worship. seeing you in person at church, I'm really kind of excited about sharing with you from my home. I live here with my husband, Jeff, and my two grown-up sons. And since we all have to stay home together right now, I'm pretty happy that it gets to be with these guys. Hi, Mom. Oh, hi, Ethan. That's Ethan, my youngest son. He's super strong. And actually, he's really a hard worker, too, and very brave. Ethan is the kind of person that helps us feel safe and protected. Now, you probably won't see my older son, Digby, but he, what, did you see something? I wouldn't say that he's shy, but he usually doesn't show up unless he feels really comfortable around you or if he knows that he can be helpful in some way. When Digby does show up, you know it's because he cares about you. Hello, everybody. Aw, thanks, Diggs. Digby is very kind and generous. He often puts his needs aside to help others. He's the kind of person that helps us feel supported and loved. And then there's my husband, Jeff. And maybe some of you have seen him around church before. He almost always has a pair of binoculars with him. Jeff loves being outside and in nature, watching birds. In fact, he says that birds are beautiful and smart and funny. And you know what? I think the same things about Jeff. I think he's beautiful and smart and funny too. He's the kind of person that reminds us to stop and appreciate the beauty of God's creation. Being brave and kind and observant is what makes Ethan, Digby, and Jeff so special. It's kind of like their superhero powers because when they share their gifts with the world, it helps all of us feel safe, supported, loved, and appreciated. 
You know we all have superhero powers, don't you? Each one of us has special gifts that I say come from God because we are born into the world with them. It's just the way we're made. Superpowers are the very thing that make you the one and only best ever you. Maybe some of you are super brave, helpful, kind, and observant too. Or maybe you're super creative or super athletic or super quiet and thoughtful. If you know what it is that makes you super special, shout it out right now. Wow! If you need some time to think about it and talk it over with your parents, just make sure you send me a message later. I'd love to hear you shout to the world what makes you so super special. The world needs you just the way you are right now. And God needs you and loves you just the way you are right now. And your church family loves you too. You make this a better place just by being here. And so remember, until we can be together again, you have to keep washing your hands and wearing your face masks. And I made one that I want to share with you. It gives me joy. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe my superhero power is joy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katrina and I'll be reading Luke chapter 17 verses 20 through 21. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. I invite you to relax and close your eyes for a moment if you wish and breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in God's presence. Breathe out and away darkness, frustration, anxiety. In silence, open yourself to God. Imagine the love of God present with you. Imagine being in a restful place. Imagine that that restful place is the Spirit of God. Listen for the voice of the Spirit of God that may lead you. In prayer, focus now upon God. Called in the scriptures, holy, loving, a refuge, a rock, righteous, compassionate. What part of God do you need today? In your mind, Explore that attribute of God. Think of the last few days. What feels unfinished? What feels hurtful? What feels brooding? What relationships are strained? Where are the places in your life that are bound or bleeding? I invite you to lay them before God in silence. Now express words of thanksgiving. Are there things that have brought joy to your life lately? If there are prayers of gratitude, I invite you to share them aloud now with God.
pray for those who are sick, those uh, whose needs we have on our minds, for ourselves, for others, for those in our congregation, for people in the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Ask God to help you in recognizing how you are like yeast in the world. What small but vital thing that you may be doing in others today. And so bring the bread of your life to them. Let us be thankful that God has heard these prayers, that you have received an answer in some form, whether a door has been opened or you may have in this week a clearer idea or find new peace. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. parable the kingdom of God can be compared to a woman making bread. She takes measures of the flour and mixes it in the yeast until it permeates every part of the dough. Leaven is a substance, typically yeast used to make bread dough rise. Leaven full of microbes and yeast quickly permeate dough eating the sugars, giving the dough upward mobility as it digests those sugars. Bread itself is older than metal. There's speculation that perhaps it was discovered by a teenager whose mother made porridge for them. They left the porridge in their room overnight, perhaps a little too long, and the wild yeast and bacteria colonized that porridge. Thrown into the fire, it would have created one of the first rudimentary breads. This is because yeast is everywhere. We don't see it directly with the naked eye but its presence affects our lives and food systems. Take this bread I'm shaping, for example. The yeast, which I inoculated it with through my leaven, have permeated the dough and are changing its very nature. 
softening the flavor and imparting the most divine flavors. This relationship has made me understand that I'm not just a baker, but a yeast farmer, without the knowledge of how to nurture the leaven, or even what it was, would create a very different looking loaf of bread. Yeast is found everywhere, even in the harshest climates. Take Las Vegas, my home, for example. Many would describe the desert as desolate and lifeless, but the truth is that wild yeast and bacteria are everywhere. And thriving here amidst this landscape, fermenting my sourdough. Fermentation is the process that yeast create by chemically breaking down food. Yeast is all around you, creating some of the most delicious products that you consume on a regular basis. Too many to name, but I'll list a few. That chocolate bar you love had to undergo fermentation to take out the bitterness of the bean. That coffee many of us drink as a morning daily ritual underwent fermentation as well. That vinegar in your salad dressing and the cheese you ate it with And my favorite, that bread you had with cultured butter. There was a study done in Belgium with a few bakers from around the world. They gave each baker the same flour from the same mill in Belgium and had them make a loaf of bread with their own leaven. Then they flew a few of them to Belgium and did a series of tests, one that swabbed the hands of each of the bakers. They found a microbial match between the loaf and the baker. You could match the loaf to the baker by just looking at the bacteria and the yeast on their hands. In an interview with NPR, the ecologist Robert Dunn that created the experiment is quoted saying, the other one, to which our design was not perfect for, but was the crazier one for me, was that we'd swab the hands of the bakers to figure out what was on their hands. And it was the same thing that was in the starter. We hadn't thought to wonder if the baker's hands themselves would be unusual. But lo and behold, the baker's hands looked like sourdough. So yes, the bakers did influence their starters. But the other way was also true. The life of baking seems to also influence the bakers. Yeast, seemingly insignificant, is everywhere influencing the food we eat and the body we inhabit and the world we live in. Amen. I decided to preach today from my kitchen. Never preached from my kitchen before. <laughs> Actually, my, my children might disagree with that one. But it just seemed appropriate, given that today we heard a scripture about leaven and flour we know that Jesus' parables painted a picture from everyday life in order to make a moral or a religious point. He talks about a woman who loses a coin, workers in a vineyard, a lost sheep, a wayward child who returns home. But what's not often said about the parables of Jesus is that many times Jesus put together two things that don't normally go together in his culture, like good with Samaritan, for example. Emily read to us today from Matthew 13. That's a chapter in our Bibles that has Jesus just telling rapid fire parables. The parable she read is simply one sentence long, a story in one verse. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it had permeated every part of the dough. Now I imagine that if we'd been there when Jesus first told this parable, we would have maybe even stopped playing words with friends, looked up from our smartphones and thought, what did he just say? You see, before Passover, Jews are supposed to remove all leaven from their homes. It's a reminder to them that when their ancestors escaped from the slavery of Egypt, they left in such a hurry that they did not have time to let the dough rise. They packed up their unleavened bread and ran out the door. Exodus 12 says, you shall eat nothing leavened. 
in all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. So for eight days at the time of Passover, Jews do not eat leavened bread, and they are supposed to rid their houses of it. But in this parable, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to leaven that's hidden in the flour. <laughs> Talk about not knowing your audience. He doesn't compare the kingdom of God to the woman doing that, but to the actual leaven. And it's unthinkable for Jesus to compare the kingdom of God to leaven, which is used in scripture as a metaphor for something corrupt. Jesus himself uses it that way when he tells his disciples to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Even Jesus used yeast as a symbol of something false. He's telling them to be wary of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he uses yeast to warn them. And if that isn't enough, in this parable, a woman hid leaven in the flour. The word in the Greek for hid here is actually better translated to be encrypted. She encrypted the leaven into the flour. There's just something so subversive happening here. Plus she encrypts it into three measures of flour. That would have been equal to about 40 pounds of flour, enough to feed a hundred people, enough for a feast. Sometimes I think that Jesus was absolutely mischievous in his parables. This one about the leaven, hidden in the flour, follows right after the one about the kingdom of heaven being like a tiny mustard seed that grows into the greatest of shrubs. I have never thought to myself when looking at a mustard plant, wow, that will grow into the greatest of shrubs. Rub? Once again, Jesus was getting the attention of his listeners in a culture that honored the great cedar for being strong and durable. Jesus goes with a mustard plant, not even an olive tree or a cypress. No, Jesus picks a weed. It's like saying to someone in the South, the kingdom of heaven is like kudzu. It's a pest. It invades where it doesn't belong. It spreads beyond anything you could imagine, infiltrating a system and taking over the host. The kingdom of God is its like pestilence. And saying that seems downright scandalous. It makes me think of something I learned recently. Most of you will remember the Deepwater Horizon explosion in April of 2010 that led to the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It was the largest marine oil spill in history. 11 men lost their lives. Many others were injured. Oil flowed into the Gulf waters for 87 straight days. 491 miles of coastland was contaminated. We got to see that damage done to the environment and wildlife through media reports. And in May of that year, politicians pressured BP Oil to release the live video footage of the leak. It was dubbed the Spill Cam. I remember watching that video as gallons of oil were pouring into the ocean. A good solid estimate of the amount of oil that ran into the ocean before they could plug the leak was 210 million gallons. Engineers jumped in to try to stop the oil from leaking, but for almost three months, they were unsuccessful in figuring out how to stop it. During the summer of 2010, about 47,000 people and 7,000 ships were involved in the containment and cleanup of the spill. Some of those were volunteers, and still it cost over $14 billion for that cleanup. All kinds of strategies were used to help with the effort. One state constructed barrier islands. Others created sorbent booms. Skimmers and combustion techniques were used. Oil dispersants were put into the ocean to break up the oil. But studies showed that this just increased the oil's toxicity by 52 times. 
There was even a campaign to encourage hair salons, dog groomers, and sheep farmers to donate their hair and fur clippings, which were then stuffed into pantyhose to help contain oil near beaches. But there was a low success rate. In fact, they, they figured 60% of the oil remained unaccounted for after the cleanup was discontinued. But since then, the Journal of Microbiome published findings about a group of bacteria trawled from the depths of the Challenger Deep. Challenger Deep is the deepest known point in the Earth's oceans and is found at the southern end of the Mariana Trench. The water pressure alone in Challenger Deep makes exploration there very difficult. This group of bacteria they found there not only survives the extreme conditions, but it's also the kind that feeds on hydrocarbon molecules found in everyday crude oil and natural gas. Oil-eating bacteria like these are also found on the ocean surface and they help degrade much of the oil from the BP oil spill. While sheep farmers were saving fur, these microbes were gobbling up the mess. It turns out that this kind of bacteria is found in nearly every environment on Earth. But the highest concentration of them is found in the Mariana Trench. These microbes did a good job of chomping down the natural gas that was spilled, but they didn't clean it all up. They didn't clean up everything. As one scientist studying this bacteria wrote, microbes are like teenagers. You can ask them to clean the garage over the weekend. Can they do it? Yes. Will they do it? Maybe. So when I heard about this oil-eating bacteria, it made me think of a maybe a possible modern day parable. It would go like this. The kingdom of God is like the microbes that live on the surface of the ocean, completely invisible to our view, but they aren't only on the surface of the ocean. They are found everywhere, infiltrating all systems. So if the kingdom of God is like yeast permeating the whole dough or like microbes found in all systems, what? Who are the yeast and the microbes in the kingdom of God? I think it could be us. I really do. I think we have the potential to be pestilence. After all, in, this scripture, in the scripture that Katrina read this morning, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is within us. It isn't something you can point to out there. We carry it in our very beings. I think the kingdom of God is present in the scandalousness of our message, the way of the cross, the way of loving enough to fully sacrifice. The kingdom of God is like yeast and the oil eating microbes and like us. Seemingly insignificant in the realm of the empire, lying dormant until we can spring into action and infiltrate systems and rise again with goodness, kindness, justice, and love. Oil-eating properties. I think we have a superpower and it is unrecognizable to the eyes of the world. We have the potential to rise up when needed. We flourish in a crisis. We hold steady. We speak truth to power. We produce music, art, inspiration. We prophesy. We stop and breathe and advocate for the environment. We care for children and the vulnerable. We refuse to prioritize profit over people. We show up where we're needed. Our welcome is wide enough to include all of God's children. We continue to figure out how to deliver meals to the homeless shelter, even while practicing physical distancing. We continue to connect with each other in meaningful ways, even when the carpet of closeness is pulled right out from under us. Our smallness, our invisibility is our superpower. We infiltrate systems because we look so harmless. But folks, we are everywhere. I'm telling you this 
because I think you've forgotten it. I think that too often you let the kingdom of the world tell you that you are helpless and that everything is hopeless. But look around you. You will see that the kingdom of God is alive right now. The power is within us. We must not forget our superpower. So using the analogy of the scientists studying microbes, I have one question for you today. Will we use our collective agency to clean the garage or won't we? Amen.
So sing on, dance on, you followers of the Lamb, you encrypted yeast, you oil-eating bacteria, because you carry the kingdom of God within you. You have the power, the power to infiltrate the world with the transforming power of light and love. So rise up, rise up, you followers of the Lamb. Amen.